Okay, this will be the lecture for chapter 6, and we'll be talking about momentum. First, I'll kind of define what momentum is and talk about how we can change momentum. It turns out that that's going to be using an impulse, so impulse is going to change momentum. We'll talk about a special case of changing momentum where there's some bouncing involved. We'll talk about that momentum is going to be one of these conserved quantities. We'll talk about how that impacts collisions, and we'll talk about two types of collisions. We're going to talk about elastic collisions, and we're going to talk about inelastic collisions. And I'll just very briefly mention some more complicated collisions. Now, what is momentum? Momentum is a property of moving things, and there's actually analogies in, for example, you know, sports or politics or something like that, where they say, you know, one team has momentum. What that kind of means is, you know, they're moving, and they want to keep on moving. So really, it's kind of like inertia in motion. Now, in equation form, momentum is kind of given that symbol P, and it's going to be equal to mass multiplied by velocity. So for example, suppose I had a car with a mass of 1,000 kilograms and a speed of 20 meters per second, then its momentum is going to be 1,000 kilograms multiplied by 20 meters per second. So it's going to be 20,000 with a unit of kilogram meter per second. So if you ever see something with a unit of kilogram meter per second, you know you're talking about a momentum. And one thing that you know, we have kind of have to pay attention to is, is velocity is a vector. Momentum is also a vector. If I have something that is moving in this direction, and I'm going to call this the positive side, then the velocity would be positive and the momentum would be negative. If I had an object moving in this direction, and I called this you know, the negative side of the slide, then my momentum would be negative. And the positive and negatives are going to be really important in this chapter. So let's just kind of you know, conceptually think about momentum for a second. Um, consider we had a moving boulder compared to a small stone moving at the same speed. Which one has more momentum? I would expect it to be the boulder. Why? Because momentum is going to be equal to mass times velocity. And the moving boulder is far more, far more massive for the same amount of speed we had a fast boulder versus a slow boulder, you know, if both, both, both boulders were the same amount of speed, the faster boulder, boulder is going to have more momentum because this number right here is going to be larger. And a boulder at rest, well, the speed is equal to zero, and so the momentum is also equal to zero kilogram meter per second. So just take a second and you know, think about the answer to this one. If you double your velocity, so you're going from 30 to 60, then you would probably expect to double your momentum simply because momentum is going to be equal to mass multiplied by velocity. And if we go ahead and we double this guy, then I would expect that guy to double as well. So this guy goes up, that guy also goes up. Now, how do we change our momentum? It turns out we change our momentum using an impulse, and an impulse is going to be defined as a change in momentum, that, where that little triangle right there just kind of means a change. You could also kind of write that as you know, momentum final minus momentum initial, if you will. And another definition of impulse is going to be equal to a, f a force multiplied by how long it acts for. Now, kind of some Practical applications for this would be, you can check out the Mythbusters dumpster dive, but let's talk about crumple zones in cars. So suppose you know, I have a car, and my car is traveling at some speed, and then at some time later, the car has came to a stop, so the speed is equal to zero. So we can definitely say that there's been a change in momentum, and it's going to be essentially you know, the momentum final minus the momentum initial. Well, you know, finally it's going to be zero, so initially it's going to be equal to some mass multiplied by some speed, essentially minus zero, and that's going to be equal to a change in momentum, and there's not a whole lot we can do about that. However, if we were concerned about the force, we know that this change in momentum is also going to be equal to the force multiplied by time, and again, that's going to be the mass of the car multiplied by how fast we're going. If we were to say, you know what, I want to extend, I, I want the force to be as small as possible, and this is just some number, call it you know, 10 if you will, then there's a lot of ways I can multiply force and time together to, to be, reach 10, right? 
this could be 10 and this could be 1, or this could be 1 and that could be 10. If we wanted to have as small as a force as possible, then you want the time to you know, be as large as it is, right? You kind of see here this is 1 and this is 10 versus the 10 and the 1. Now, crumple zones in cars, what they do is they say, okay, well, your car has got some momentum associated with it, and we want your body to experience as little force as possible, so we want to extend the time you know, of, of any crunching that's going to occur. So what kind of happens in a car when it undergoes a collision is, is the engine is going to drop out, and it's going to essentially allow the car to fold up like an accordion, extending this time as long as possible, making the force on you much smaller. That's also why we have airbags in cars. Airbags have you know, a lot more time associated with them than, say, the dashboard or steering wheel, steering wheel of your car. It's also kind of why you know, classic firefighters you know, gathered around like this with a big thing with a bullseye. What they're trying to do is they're trying to say, OK, you know, go ahead and jump right here. We'll extend the time that you're slowing down. We can't do anything about your momentum, but you know, the time of landing in this is going to be far more comfortable than the time of landing on some cement. So let's just take a quick example of this. Suppose we have a cannonball and it's shot from a cannon with a long barrel. Um, it's going to have a greater speed and the question is, is you know, why is this? So let's kind of, kind of draw this guy right here. This can be a cannon with a short barrel. Here we're going to have a cannon with a long barrel. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to pack a charge in these guys and say this is the same amount of gunpowder in each. I can go ahead and put the cannonball right here, the cannonball right here. Now it turns out that this one right here, the force is going to be happening for a very, very, very long time. So we're going to have some force and the time is going to be quite large. Now this guy right here, it's got you know the same amount of force. The gunpowder has a, a certain amount of you know go-go juice to it, if you will but for a very, very, very short time. So the time is relatively small. So the impulse is going to be larger for a longer barrel than for a shorter barrel. Now, that example in the previous slide also you know, kind of tells you why golfers or people that play baseball or you know, a lot of contact sports, they're told to follow through or to you know, swing through the ball. And kind of the reason behind that is they're trying to give the ball most momentum possible, the largest velocity, and change in momentum is going to be equal to force multiplied by time. So as you extend this time of contact, then it doesn't matter whether the force is large or small. I mean, it's still a force. What we can do is we can give the ball as much momentum as we possibly can. So that's why golfers tend to you know, swing through and they want to increase the time of contact. Same thing with base baseball. Now, there could be a case where we're, we could be talking about decreasing momentum. And again, remember that the change in momentum is going to be equal to the force multiplied by time. And generally, when we talk about decreasing momentum, we're talking about um, you know, airbags or crumple zones or things of that nature. And I have some examples on the next two slides. So if we were to consider you know, a car or a truck that is you know, out, of, out of control, then you know, what momentum says is you know, it's the change in momentum is going to be equal to the force multiplied by the time. And that car or truck has got some momentum, and it's definitely going to depend on the mass and the speed, but there's not a whole lot we can do about that. Now, if you consider you know, this truck right here, and it hits a haystack, then we're applying that force over a very long time. So you can kind of see how time is much larger, and force is going to be much smaller. If we have the same truck with the same amount of momentum, the same mass and velocity, and he hits just a concrete wall, then the time of contact is relatively large, or small, so the force is going to be relatively large. So let's just kind of you know, do this once again with numbers. Suppose the mass times the velocity is going to be five kilograms meter per second. And there's a lot of ways we can multiply these, or multiply the force and the time together in order to get that. In this case right here, we can say that the time might be equal to one, so the force is equal to five. In this case down here, we might say that the force is equal to five and the time is equal to one. So kind of see shorter time, longer time, larger force, smaller force.
just some more examples of decreasing momentum. So if you're you know, jumping from a large distance, then it's better to bend your knees when your feet make contact with the ground rather than to straight leg it. The reason for that is we're kind of extending the time and reducing the force on you. You know, in boxing and you know, with life, you know, sometimes you just have to roll with the punches. If you consider this boxer right here, and he moves backwards as this punch is coming towards him, then what he's doing is he's, he's extending the time of contact, and essentially decreasing the amount of force that he has. If the boxer were to you know, roll into the punch rather than rolling with the punch, so if the boxer is going this way, the punch is coming this way, then the time of contact is going to be relatively short, so the force is going to be relatively large, and I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like fun to me. So just take a second and think about this. If we have an impulse where the force acts for twice as long, then what happens to the impulse? Well, if you think about it, you know, impulse is going to be equal to the force multiplied by the time, and we're told that the you know, force state kind of stays the same, but the time is twice as long. So if we go ahead and we make this guy two times as much, I would expect the impulse to go up also by two times as much, so it should be doubled. Now, something that's kind of interesting is, is, is that if objects bounce, the impulse tends to be greater. Now, remember that impulse is going to be defined as the change in momentum. And if you think about this guy right here, he's going at 30 meters per second, and he has a mass of 10 kilograms. And we could kind of say, well, what happens if he were just to totally stop? Just like that, then the change in momentum is going to be the mass times velocity final minus the mass times velocity initial, and the final is going to be equal to zero, and the initial is simply going to be equal to, to his mass, which is going to be 10 kilograms, multiplied by 30 meters per second, and there is a little negative sign right there, we'll talk about that in a little bit, and so we're left with a change in momentum of negative 300 kilogram meter per second. Now what, what would happen if this guy were to bounce? So maybe if rather than he changed his momentum to be equal to zero, but he maybe you know, hits this solid wall and then is kind of moving in that direction with, with a speed of 30 meters per second, then what would kind of happen is, is the change in momentum would now still be his mass times velocity final minus his mass times velocity initial. But now, his speed is going to be in what I would call the negative direction. We're calling this direction positive and that direction negative. So his mass times velocity final would actually be 10 multiplied by negative 30 meters per second. And that's going to be minus his mass times velocity initial, which is going to be equal to 10 times 30 meters per second. And what we're kind of left with is we're left with a change in momentum that's equal to negative 600 kilograms meters per second. And all the negative sign means is it went from being in this direction to being in this direction right here. But the number here, this is, this is negative 600, and that's a lot larger than the negative 300 we got when the fellow didn't bounce. So you could also kind of think about you know, catching a falling flower pot with your hands, you know, it takes some momentum. If we throw the pot back up again, then that's extra impulse, and so we're kind of doubling the impulse when something bounces. Now, practical applications of this is you think about like a mill wheel or something like that. If we've got some water kind of falling down into it, if we could catch the water, that would be great. It's going to go ahead and make this wall turn. But if we were, if we could make the water come down and then splash back out, that's going to essentially leave us with a larger impulse and a larger force so the wheel is going to turn faster. And believe it or not, they actually did know this when they went ahead and they built a lot of the old mills.